From the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Bracely, presented by a Cloud Guru, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast, coming to you live from the massive studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, it's been a little while since we've talked about serverless. Obviously, we uh, we made a big focus of it in the springtime uh, around the last serverless conference. Uh, you know, been kicking off serverless cast for a while. And, um, you know, it's been a little while, not out of uh, lack of interest for it, but just, you know, we got busy with some things, had a lot of other shows. But, you know, we thought with the serverless conf coming back to New York City here uh, last week, it was time to kind of dig back into that, see what's going on in the community, see what trends have changed in the last six months. And so very excited to have with us uh, old friend of the show and uh, good to have him back on the show, Ryan Brown, who is... Um, software engineer over at Ansible, but also how we really got to know him was um, his work over at the Serverless Code website and uh, having been heavily, heavily involved with Serverless sort of since day one. So Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, Brian. Long time listener, first time caller. Um. <laughs> Great to have you on. Um, you know, we, we really kind of got to know you. Uh, I mean, you're, you are part of Ansible, although you live up in Buffalo, uh, but we sort of we've known the Ansible guys for a long time. But you know, as we were starting to kind of scratch the surface of serverless, you know, way back in the day, probably, you know, a couple of years ago, um, we kept seeing references to this website, Serverless Code. And we were like, oh, okay, that's sort of interesting. And there was a bunch of interesting articles there. Some of them were sort of aggregated. You were involved with that. You were you were writing a lot of it. You were aggregating a lot of stuff. Like, give us kind of how you got involved with serverless, especially a couple of years ago when it was really just you know, it's kind of obscure technology. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it hasn't been that long. It's, um, let's see, I think I started in late, it would have been late 15, yep. that site, um, about the time that the serverless framework was renaming from JAWS, kind of that area. And what got me really interested was actually using it for kind of glue. My first project was to run a static site generator in a Lambda function. Okay. Um, so it would take stuff from S3, run that through a static site generator in Lambda and then dump that out to S3. So serverless CMS, if you will. Okay, sure. And uh, that was my first project. And that's actually still how serverless code runs is that's going through a code commit Lambda code pipeline setup. Okay. So you were, you were living, you were living the technology. It sort of uh, was, was your front end and back end, And that's very cool. So, yeah. so you've been, You've been involved um, kind of in this in this community uh, in the serverless conf events since day one. Um, give us a sense. You were you were obviously there last week in New York. Um, you know what what does the community look like here in fall of 2017 versus even you know last spring or last year? What are the big trends that you've seen change and, and evolve over time? Um, I think the two would be the adoption in terms of just the number of people that are adopting it for different things. And the kinds of things that people are talking about. So the first serverless conf was in Brooklyn, right around 200, 220 people. And where um, a lot of the talks were about was, what is this serverless thing? You know, what counts, kind of what doesn't count? Um, a lot of small companies that had built their things on serverless from day one. So there were uh, people like Joe Emerson who built a uh, large part of uh, the company he was working for at the time. Actually, I think he's still working there. Build facts. On, facts. Yeah, yep. Build Facts. That's right. And talking about how he was gluing all these different services together to form an application. Um, the tone has changed a lot since then. Now it's a lot more, how do I get everything onto serverless? Right. Um, there have been a lot of uh, people talking about monitoring and sort of the op the operational concerns of, I'm actually running my business on this and this is actually critical. So the shift that way has been really, really obvious and it sort of goes further that way every serverless conf so far. Yeah, that was the thing, um, sort of watching from afar. I, I unfortunately was, was, was ill and couldn't get up there and so I was watching a lot of it via Twitter. And, you know, like you said, the last couple of shows, um, you know, it was, it was kind of this small community. Uh, the, everybody knew each other, but but like if you were, say for example, like, kind of in the cloud community or the DevOps community, you would go, yeah, I, don't, I don't necessarily know a lot of those people. Like, uh, you know, cool stuff they're doing, but necessarily know a lot of those people. This time I was, I was watching and, and I'm seeing 
kind of familiar faces pop up. Like I saw John Willis, who's kind of the, the face of the DevOps community and saw Simon Wardley, who, um, you know, likes to predict the future and Charity Majors was there, you know, talking about operations, which, you know, operations never really got talked about in the past because it was like, hey, it's just taken care of for you. And so, yeah, you're right. It, it felt very much like this, this um, the problem space that was trying to be solved was like, hey, went from sort of a niche thing to, hey, we're going to solve everything, put all your applications here, here's how you deal with those problems. And I don't know if that was kind of done on purpose uh, to, to, to bring in the community to be bigger or that just sort of the natural gravitational pull of, of serverless. Um, I think it's the progression of things that are able to tie into serverless for reaching kind of a critical mass where you can build your whole thing. So once you have, once you have enough event providers and event integrations, you can make some really sweet stuff. Yeah. Because if you looked back, you know, May of uh, May of last year, your options for integrating with something like Lambda were okay. You have Kinesis, you have Dynamo, and sort of API Gateway was just starting to exist. Right. And now you have still all of those, and all of those have improved. But you also have things like talk to Aurora, talk to um, external services. Um, you have people like auth zero that have their own function as a service thing that you can tie together. Um, just the ecosystem has gotten a lot bigger. So the people who were trying out are now, um, maturing into that, into that, uh, bigger company that's doing more things. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And, and, you know, even thinking back to like when we talked to, uh, Joe Emerson, you know, a year plus ago, it, you know, he was kind of dabbling with those things, you know, well, NetLafly does this and Auth0 does this and uh, you can kind of sort of glue them together. But but like you said, um, you know, the, the way that you're going to integrate with other services is really where serverless starts to explode. Um, you know, just the fact that you can do something in Lambda is, OK, moderately interesting. But how you get to data services, how you get to third party services is is where everything starts to explode. Um Let's kind yeah. of let's kind of let's kind of scratch that a little bit. Um, you know, if, if we're starting to to throw out the premise that serverless is becoming this this bigger thing, um, let, let's talk about some of the other stuff that tends to follow when things get bigger. You know, a lot of serverless still tends to be very lambda centric, AWS centric. Um, you know, Azure's making a, a push. Um, like you said, there's some other services. Uh, you know, sort of the NetLaflies and Auth zeros and others. Are we seeing any sort of open source uh, things that are viable yet in this, um, you know, that are that are more than just sort of side projects? Is that becoming a viable part of the community yet? Um, I, I mean, initially there were a lot of, oh, hey, you can do you can use kind of Docker or Kubernetes to make a function as a service. So there were a lot of those kind of tools. Mm -hmm. um, the oh, viable open source things, I think, I'd fall in two camps. Um, the first is OpenWhisk, I think, is the only viable like open source function as a service okay. because it's got really, really nice support for uh, different languages. You can bring your own runtime if you need to. And the event sources that they talk to are really good. And the event sources are what really makes a uh, function as a service offering useful because right. running side effect free code in a container ephemerally is not inherently useful to anyone. And then the other side is tooling around serverless, which is a uh, serverless framework is obviously the big one. Zappa, Sparta, Apex are all sort of get my code to the serverless runtime type tools. Yep. And then the last thing is, um, or the last kind of category that I lump things into is stuff built on serverless that's open source. So that's things like LAM CI that, are a tool that you can use that's built on Lambda that you can deploy in your own account and run yourself. But having that function as a service kind of underpinning makes it really easy to make those um, open source products runnable by a lot of people. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, so like Cloud Custodian is another good one. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Now, what about, um, you know, there's always the, the old adage of, you know, follow the money. Uh, we've seen a little bit of, of VC funding in this space. So, uh, you know, we had the folks from IO Pipes on. They recently took some funding. Uh, obviously, A Cloud Guru is, is kind of built on Lambda, even though they're, uh, you know, doing uh, learning and so forth. They've taken some VC funding. Um, was there much, you know, did you see much hallway conversation or hearing much in terms of, you know, people getting the, the 25, 30, $40 million VC rounds, or is this 
kind of a different way in which money is going to flow into the into the ecosystem? So that's an interesting question. Um, like a cloud guru obviously isn't funded for doing serverless things. They're funded for teaching people to cloud. Exactly. Um, and I think that that's going to be a trend that you see all over sort of serverless is people who use it to do something, get funded for that thing. But the real big money in, in this space is in the mega providers. So your Microsoft's, your Amazon's, your Google's and Inside of Amazon, there's huge amounts of money flowing around to hire people for the Lambda team, hire people for a Lambda team talking to other people, um, kind of serverless adjacent services like Dynamo, um, Microsoft, same thing. They've been on a huge run for hiring dev advocates focused around serverless. Yep. Um, so I think the real big money is in the providers because they're the ones that are trying to push the tooling forward the most. And then a lot of the other the other people that have gotten funding, like Serverless Framework, IOPipe, Stackery, um, they're gonna I feel like have a smaller amount of funding because they don't need as big of a team to get stuff done, and they can do a lot more kind of bootstrapped. I have revenue from this tool on Serverless, and then I'm gonna inject that back in and build up from there. Right. Right. Well, and, and to a certain extent, that makes sense because. Typically, at some point, you, know, you have to take these rounds of funding to do sales enablement and marketing and sort of define your market. I mean, in essence, Amazon has put you know a, a ton, a ton of money into defining the market, hyping it up, and, and so people are already talking about it before anybody else has to uh, you know kind of define it. If you're building things on top, so that, that, that does make sense. It's definitely a, a different flow of how money goes into the ecosystem than we, we're sort of used to, but. Uh, Um, You know, serverless is also a different way of building things. So, you know, it kind of plays to the idea that um, you kind of have to forget some of the the knowledge you have of how the rules work in this new game and and start to look at what the new rules look like and so forth. Um, Yeah, I think that combined with just the leverage you get when your engineers are building something, because a lot of these uh, serverless companies are using kind of very platform as a service, fast things right. inside so they get a lot more leverage per engineer anyways right right yeah you talk about somebody like irobot or, or something like that where they're building much more than anything that's technology you see it's it's the the rest of the business so let's talk a little bit about your talk um you know obviously you've you've spoken there a couple of times but i liked the the focus you had of this talk which was kind of this intersection between you know how do you deal with with new applications but also how do you deal with traditionally, if you're an IT organization, what you already have, which, which to me is kind of the, the 80% question that, that most companies have. So, you know, if you're not completely a greenfield, you have to go, well, there's some new cool stuff out there, but then I have some existing stuff. How do I marry the two together? G- give us a sense of what was your talk focused on and, and what were some of the highlights that uh, the people can take away from it? Uh, yeah. So the premise, uh, like you said, is that no one really gets a greenfield unless you're a brand new company. Right. And there are way more existing companies than new companies. And so the kind of general thrust was about how you can use good practices to use more serverless in your application and get more leverage for your engineers without throwing away everything, basically. So I started with kind of an adoption life cycle that's a good educational way to get your team going and to keep your risk low as you're trying things. So you start with kind of infrastructure glue, Lambda talks to AWS config, Lambda talks to um, your auto scaling rules, things like that. And then sort of graduating to backend and data tasks. And then finally graduating to a user critical path. A user will actually be mad if this doesn't work the first time type feature. Right. <clears throat> okay. And, you know, for folks who are, are listening to this or didn't get a chance to go to it, a couple of things. Number one, um, we will put a link in the show notes to Ryan's slides so you can see them. And then the uh, the folks that run the serverless conf, um, the A-Cloud Guru folks and the other folks, typically get the, the videos for the talks out here somewhere within a couple of weeks or a month or so after the event. So we will make sure to publish those out on Twitter and we'll, we'll backport them into this uh, into these show notes. What other common things do you see from people who say, Hey, um, okay, cool. Those are some starting points. Um, how do I get over some of the sort of second order, you know, comp- complexities that come along? What, what else have you seen, uh, from companies that are trying to do this, trying to marry the two together? Um, yeah. So they'll, one of the first things that they'll hit when they get 
kind of production workloads in serverless and then it's still backed by you know traditional applications is they'll hit some scaling woes because their lambda or other function as a service will scale as high as they want and for as many events as they want and happily slaughter any backend system right um and so that's the first thing that I tell people to watch out for is make sure that you have some way for your backend system to say, whoa, um, and have some back pressure so that you're not spinning up a million lambdas and then ruining your, you know, some other application in your infrastructure. Yeah. And then the other thing is, uh, the, the other big one is monitoring. So this is a drum that a lot of people are beating at this particular serverless conf. Um, and there's going to be a bunch of talks that, cover that like from charity again from io pipe um but the big thing is just think of your think of all of the things that you've ever sshed into a server to debug and imagine that you can't do that yep. and now you have to have tools that let you do that same level of debugging but without sshing into anything so you have to have event logging you have to have um, the ability to trace requests through your system. You have to watch how long things get, take from end to end. You want to watch the sizes of your queues. There's all kinds of things that you need to keep an eye on um, that you might not think about as hard if everything's in one system and just calls each other via your language runtime. Right. Now, one of the things, one of these these terms that I heard floating around, I never heard it before, um, that, that came out of that week was – you know, when you start talking about monitoring, you start talking about ops. There's there's always the the inevitable like, well, is serverless no ops, which freaks out op operations people. <laughs> um, and then you mentioned there was this term called sort of like diff ops. That yeah. People, so what does that mean, or where did that come from? Uh, yeah. So I think uh, I think it's uh, one of Ben Cahoe's terms, but it came from people saying, "Is serverless no ops? Is serverless no ops? Is serverless no ops?" Yep. And everyone always saying no. And the realization that things are different when you're outsourcing huge parts of what used to be your code base but are now someone else's code base provided to you as a service. Um, so you have to have the organizational capability to understand when a provider is down, you don't have control, but your provider is going to go down a lot less than if you were doing it yourself. So on a net, that's a gain, even if you feel a little out of control. And the concept that you're still responsible for your providers in that if they're down, your service is down and responsible for choosing your providers responsibly and having workarounds where that's possible. So if you have you know, a DR in another region or a DR with another provider, um, making sure that that's available and the focus on automation with diff ops, I think, is even higher than it is in traditional ops or dev ops because you have all of these different providers with all these APIs. And you, so you have a lot more configuration to manage. And the only way to sustainably do that is more automation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it sort of aligns to, you know, when, when people, you know, six, seven years ago, when, when they were first starting to grasp this concept of, of just kind of cloud and, and the idea of saying, well, you have to expect that your infrastructure will just fail. And people went, whoa, hold on a second. I, I, I've never expected that. I've always designed around it and so forth. And, and, and then once you grasp the concept and you start going, okay, if, if that's the assumption I have to make, then, then this has to happen and that has to happen. This feels like is sort of that next logical extension, which is, um, you know, certain things will get taken care of for you. Uh, but you know, you do still have to plan a little bit if it goes away. Um, there are certain ways you have to think about security. There are certain things you have to think about in terms of, like you said, scaling or not having to worry about scaling. So, um, it, I, I guess it's good that there's, there's sort of a new term floating around. Um, it'll be interesting to see how much that gets mutated and so forth. Cause again, people get kind of freaked out about, about change more than they get uh, freaked out about, about new terms and so forth. Um, yeah, that's definitely true. So I think that there's going to be a lot more discussion on that. But as long as we don't call it Jeff or Steve or something, I think we'll be good. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, s switching gears from sort of the ops side to the to the developer side, um, have we have we started to see any patterns emerge in terms of common ways that people are developing? You know, the, the one of the challenges that I see with with the serverless space is people go, okay. 
what's it useful for? And then there's a, a laundry list of, of spaces where you could use serverless. It's, you know, it's IOT, it's sensors, it's chatbots, it's, uh, you know, CMDB systems like you, you know, it's, it's sort of all over the place. Um, that makes it a little tricky to say, oh, okay, here's common development patterns. Are we seeing that start to emerge yet or common tools that people are using or, or where's sort of the developer, uh, bubble at this point? Um, yeah, I mean, pretty, pretty broad. I think the, the best way that I would explain what serverless is good for is, do you have problems that can be expressed as events causing stuff to happen? And that's intentionally super broad, Mm -hmm. but big buckets that I see are kind of your API backend as a service, um, providing a backend for your application or your web application. There's that bucket. There's sort of hook style events. So things like chatbots are really event driven because every time a user sends a message, you got to do something about it or they'll be like, hey, where'd your where'd your bot go? Right. And then um, IOT is another thing that's really event driven because this is people or stuff physically interacting with the real world. And all that has a bunch of events associated and um, cost becomes a major factor, too, because you know, you have a hundred dollar device and you get like seven cents of that to provide backend for the rest of the device's lifetime or something. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the not paying for idle is a big deal with the IOT part. Right. Right. Do you, do you feel like people are okay with the fact that, you know, things are so broad at this point there, there's so many ways that you can use it. Or do you feel like there's, there's something on the horizon where people are going, well, you know, in order for us to get past the number of people that are showing up at serverless comp or whatever, there needs to be something. What, what's the, what do you feel like is kind of the pressure in the development space? Is it let it be loosey goosey or do you feel like there's something emerging? Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to emerge into something specific. I think that it's only going to get kind of wider as more and more event sources get looped in and more and more like kind of targeted, systems happen so like uh benaris is uh they're a serverless runtime focused on performance so their thing is you know we do four millisecond invocation round trips that's our thing yeah and for a lot of workloads uh the high latency of something like lambda just doesn't work because your api gateway to lambda and back cycle is about 120 to 180 milliseconds right now Mm -hmm. and there are some applications that's just never going to work right And so as you get more and more of these companies seeing, oh, these people want the developer benefits of less overall overhead, I can move faster, I can talk to more events, but I have this one blocker that's stopping me from going, I think more things are going to spring up to unblock those people and the community is just going to get kind of wider. And I think that it's true that serverless conf is sort of a super advanced cloud conference. Sure to an extent because it's just people that are yeah, crazy they've passionate done, about this. And that's yeah. Awesome. They've done the, they've done the cloud native thing and are so excited about the next level that's available with serverless where they have the ability to just cut off all of their underlying automation that makes their platform run and just outsource that. Right. Everyone's super excited about not having to deal with that. Right. And so I think that the number of people that don't want to deal with that is only going to get bigger. Yeah. Yeah, it, we are we are definitely in a weird time in that um, you know you've got something like serverless, which um, the serverless conf is is growing quickly, uh, and, and people look at that and they go, oh wow, there's a there's a space for an entire conference about serverless. Uh, you go to you go to reinvent, and and there's just a ton about lambda and green grass and all those sort of things, and and people on one side of the fence are going to get a sense of like, oh my gosh, this is this is taking over everything. And then on the complete opposite side of things, you know, you had IBM announce this week that uh, they announced their earnings and their earnings are mostly being driven by like new things going on around the mainframe. And so you get this, this sort of whiplash effect of like, wait a second, is everything going to serverless or what, you know, is there still this other markets? And, uh, you know, I think just the, the time of the timing we're in right now is, is we're definitely in big transitions. Um, I think the, the, for me, the takeaway is like, you you no longer kind of have the constraints of like only one system will fit what you're trying to do. If if your application needs certain things, uh, there's technologies for that. And it might be Lambda and it might be serverless or it might be some sort of container platform. 
Um, whereas in the past, it was sort of like you had to go through these really weird gyrations with, with the few things that were available to you. Yeah, that's interesting that you bring up uh, IBM's earnings on the mainframe because they're also a huge contributor to OpenWhisk. Right, right. Exactly. Um, so I don't think there's I don't think there's one answer to that because I think that serverless is going to continue to grow. They're up to a whole hotel at reInvent now. I think it's the Aria mm-hmm. uh, for people that are going. Right. And I mean that's still only one fifth of reInvent, and reInvent is like four times bigger than it was in 2013 or something. Because it was like 7,000 people in 2013, I want to say, and now it's up to 30,000 or something ridiculous. Yeah, I think they're expecting maybe up to 50,000 or something. But uh, Oh, jeez. Yeah, no. It, it, yeah, if you put it in that terms and you say like, hey, a fifth of the event is going for Lambda or you know serverless, like that's as big as you – know, that's 10,000 people. Like that's as big as a lot of uh, you know really large conferences. So um, just in that – Or flip that around. If you flip that around and say a fifth of the event is looking for the super advanced cloud section – I mean, I would believe that a fifth of reInvent attendees qualify for super advanced. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and once you start to get to about a fifth, you start to, you know, in the, the sort of crossing the chasm world, you know, you're starting to, to get to beginning to, to cross the chasm, right, in the, the sort of Jeffrey Moore world. So, it, it, you know, it's definitely interesting times. It's definitely moving at a little bit faster pace than I think a lot of folks are used to. G- yeah, it's really exciting. Give me a sense um, – one of the interesting things I, I was listening to an interview uh, from the, the cloud guru guys, they were on somebody else's show and they said, one of the things that's been interesting to them having followed it so closely is, is all these ancillary companies that are starting to build around serverless. Um, you know, not just the purely technology companies, but, but the ones that are, you know, their, their company, you, you'd never know their serverless, but stuff under the covers. Like what was the, what was the hallway and the, the sort of Explo floor looking like this time? I know at, at Austin, it was beginning to be a little more than just the vendors, but what, what was, what was New York like this, this time? Um, there were tons of people that were not there for vendors. They were there to learn and they were there to, uh, evaluate for actual implementations. Like I was talking to, um, a group of people that were from one of the large oil companies. Um, Capital One always has a huge presence. Yep. Um, iRobot, obviously. Sure. But I think that the adoption is just is just uh, going to go through the roof the next year or so because of the people that I'm seeing coming to serverless conf that a year ago would have been like serverless. What do you mean? There's still servers. Right. Come on. Yeah. 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 Um, now, and about- so I think that the adoption is um, the adoption is increasing, and then the kind of hallway track. I heard um, myself and some other people were talking, and I think that we're on our way to literal one-person tech teams supporting fairly large applications, just because you can outsource so much that you can just write a little bit of glue. Like one of the workshops that's a one-day for Serverless Conf is build a clone of a Cloud Guru, yeah, and. I mean, you can't actually build an A Cloud Guru like business in one day, but the technical side, you can build pretty fast because there's a lot out there already. Right. And I think that industries are going to realize that, and the cost structure is ridiculously good. And I think we're just going to see more of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's, and that becomes very interesting, not just on the technology side of things, but, uh, you know, as a, as a business, somebody running a business, um, you know, the, the ability for, some competitor to basically come in and kind of clone what you do uh, in a really short period of time becomes, uh, you know, challenging, but, but also interesting. Um, so, well, it also gives you the ability to redo your stuff to do it in a better way as well. Right. Yeah, like everyone absolutely. gets this superpower. <clears throat> right. Exactly. Exactly. It works both ways. So in that context, you're, you're kind of a power user, you're a super user. If somebody came up to you tomorrow and said, Hey, I'm, I'm a newbie to this stuff. Where do you start them? What's a what's a path that you might suggest newbies go down? Um, I mean, the first thing I ask them is, what do they care about? Uh, because, like I said, this is a it's a pretty diverse kind of developer stack. So, if they love devices and already are into that, I would point them to like an AWS IoT type starter project. Um, if they're web dev types, there's a site called Serverless Stack uh, that'll be in the show notes. And it just gets you started making a React app that has Lambda as the back end. Um, but the big thing is just find a small project that you actually care about. And with serverless, you can actually get it done pretty quickly. Because if, you know, if you're building the full site 
and doing all the infrastructure and stuff. As a newbie, you might get stuck pretty easily. On serverless, there's a lot fewer of those places to get stuck. Right. Um, so I would recommend finding a project that you like. Like if you love fantasy football, make a little fantasy football picker site or okay. something. Yeah, okay, cool. cool. Um, so pick something that you love and then look for something that will support you in that. So if, if the thing that you love is I want to make a website for fantasy football, look to uh, something like API Gateway and then pick a front-end technology that you like and then uh, pick a database that you like. You know, so you, you, you have, it's sort of a choose your own adventure, but what I would recommend is focus on a goal first, technology second. Gotcha. No, it makes, it makes it, which is kind of how the world should be in my opinion. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's, that's sort of a a path for newbies and and you were, uh, you were kind enough to give a bunch of examples that are in the show notes. Um, we'll definitely have all those links in there. What about the flip side of this? I know there's always, um, you know, there's always a few talks from folks like Paul Johnson and, and Ben Keogh and some others that go, okay, cool. We're all excited to be here. We're all patting each other on the back. Um, what about the stuff that's, that's kind of missing? What are people saying, hey, these should be the next problem areas that, that somebody should go focus on? It's an opportunity to make things easier. What, what, what do people feel like is still either lacking or missing or just, um, you know, maybe a couple of years in they, that we should sort of rethink where we're at? Um, let's see. I think the, the low latency type performance stuff is something that's still missing from a lot of providers. There are a lot of users that don't need that stuff, so they don't think it's missing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the big things that are missing right now are, um, solid, like a solid debugging experience. Um, Microsoft has stuff that's kind of in beta. It's not released yet, but that they demoed at serverless conf that looks really nice. Yep. Um, but the inability to reproduce things locally, uh, means that you need a lot better kind of observability into your system. And there are already a lot of companies focused on that, but I just feel like we, we need more of that. Okay. And then the other thing that we need more of is, um, the ability to follow events through systems like X-ray sort of works, but there are a lot of services that it doesn't talk to. And then if you have custom stuff, it won't work. Um, so being able to trace requests through the system is another thing that's missing. Yeah. And talking to kind of enterprise systems is still missing. Um, there was one talk at Serverless Conf that uses uh, SES, which is the email service, mm-hmm. to make an API in front of a legacy service that communicates over SMTP. Oh, okay. Which is mind-blowing. But just more integrations with kind of the old stuff so people don't have to think they, re- they need to rewrite everything. Right. Um, so more patterns around like wrapping APIs and avoiding binding yourself to something legacy that you might replace later. So have like a Lambda layer in front of that, that makes the API nicer. Gotcha. Gotcha. Which, you know, in, in, to a certain extent, those are the things that we see where we, we've historically seen with, with sort of every, uh, new big trend that's come along. You know, I, I need to be able to deal with higher performance systems. Um, at some point I'm going to have to deal with my legacy stuff so that I don't have yet another silo. Uh, all this new stuff is cool and it's distributed, but how do I, how do I see it and troubleshoot and debug it? Uh, you know, I, I think you could make that argument, you know, back in the the VM days and the container days and, uh, you know, getting, getting into sort of distributed framework. So it's, I guess oh, in, sure, sure. In, that ca- in that case, I guess it's, um, it's, it's good in that, you know, we're not, necessarily reinventing um like new problem or you know we're we haven't created new problems we've never solved before we just we're going through the traditional cycle of like early adopters early you know more greenfield than brownfield stuff and um and people will eventually uh, you know they may or they may not evolve back to it right you may not necessarily yeah. need all those things if like there are some said, there are some things that just straight won't work like you right. can't have a sidecar that's just you can't have a sidecar daemon that's not allowed yeah yeah um and then there, and you can't have like an agent that's installed that ships log files off to somewhere. Like that's not that's not going to work. Yeah. And it's sort of last question, I guess I'll ask. You know, sort of bigger picture. Um, obviously, AWS and Lambda kind of define this marketplace to a certain extent. Uh, probably, you know, the biggest amount of adoption and so forth. Microsoft has been doing some really interesting work with Azure and Azure Functions, and you know, tying it into the tools that people know. Is it still kind of Amazon's game and everybody's building around that or you know are you seeing where the market's going to going to keep expanding you know beyond just maybe like one or two big cloud providers I would I would categorize it as Amazon's game to lose okay. um 
right now the vast majority of adoption and discussion is around Amazon. Yeah. Um, if there, you know, if Azure Functions continues to make such awesome stuff, I don't know if that'll continue. Um, like I'm really, really happy with, uh, I've been playing with Azure Functions and the, uh, that VS Code integration that they have sort of in beta. Right. And the debugging experience there is incredible. Right. Yeah. And, that was and the thing so I heard from people was they're, they're putting a lot of money into it. The debugging's great. It fits in the tools. It's got a lot of backend integration. Um, it definitely has a lot of potential if you will. Yeah. And I think that if they continue on that track, like and Amazon doesn't keep up, then I think that you'll see more. And then I think that there's going to be a big push for the capability for serverless that's local to, or serverless fast type things that are local. So things like OpenWhisk, I see a bright future for as well, okay. just because um, people aren't, you know, moved all the way to the cloud. As you said, mainframes are uh, huge, still huge revenue growth. Right. Okay. Well, very good. Well, listen, Ryan, with that, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of wrap it up. Um, any, any good places for folks to, um, either, you know, get in touch with you, obviously, um, you know, on, on the website for, for what you've got going on, but, uh, any other good links or, or sort of last minute things you'd like to to pass along to people? Uh, yeah. So there's a, a dev advocate at AWS that has a thing called serverless by design that lets you kind of visually build your infrastructure for your serverless application and then spits out the automation to make it. So if you want to make something visual and see how it's built, that's a really great way to do it. Cool. Um, and then as a kind of intro for that first step of adoption, that infrastructure glue, I have a, a little Lambda function that takes uh, data from your RDS instance and then puts it into your staging environment in AWS using Lambda. And so that's just a good place to kind of get started and see how you can make this infrastructure glue with a function as a service as the place that actually runs it. Yep. Yep. And then, um, I have a course for, uh, serverless framework and GraphQL web applications and that's on a cloud guru as well. Oh, okay. Excellent. Excellent. And what about real quick, uh, sort of a plug for what you do on, on the Ansible side to, to connect a, a tool that a lot of people probably know with, with some of the Lambda stuff. Um, yeah, so I work on the cloud modules for Ansible. So it's my job to make Ansible talk to all of this, everything as a service stuff. Okay. And that's, you know, why I'm so interested in the serverless frame or serverless framework and serverless conf stuff, because I think that it's super important to still have really good automation support first class for all these things. And that's what I do at Ansible is make first class support for these things. Very cool. Well, very cool. Well, listen, man, I know we covered, geez, a, a ton of different topics. Hopefully that gives people a, a pretty good sense of kind of where the community is right now. Um, you know, you can definitely hear from Ryan's voice. There's a ton of excitement around this, a lot of uh, curiosity from people. And, uh, you know, we've, we've obviously continued to be super excited about what's going on in this space. So, Ryan, thanks so much for the time today. Uh, really appreciate it, folks. We're going to wrap it up with that. Uh, for Aaron, who has been just unbelievably swamped with work, so hasn't been on calls or, you know, shows as much lately. We'll be back pretty soon. Uh, and for Ryan, thank you so much for listening as always, and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to the Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more podcasts, show notes, and everything social media. And visit acloud.guru for all your cloud training needs.